Hi there, Lindsay here, also known as The Frugal Crafter. And this week I wanna talk about something that's been circulating in the craft industry this week. It's been some spicy hot tea, I have to say. There's been some controversy. And I thought it would be interesting to discuss it here in this podcast where we can be a little more nuanced than, um, than you know what you might see on a tweet or a Facebook post or an Instagram story or even a YouTube video, which is where this controversy came from. A couple days ago, I watched a video from a fellow YouTube card maker who did a video on five things sh that she no longer buys or five things that uh, she wouldn't buy or buy to begin with or purchase again. I believe there was five items. Um, and I watched that or probably more likely listened to it when I was having my lunch the other day and didn't think anything of it. I find those videos to be kind of interesting. I've done uh, videos of th crafty things I no longer buy and I've never gotten any flack from it. And I really didn't see anything too problematic with what she was saying. In fact, I agreed with her on most points. And I wasn't thinking that any of those products were bad. I didn't get that impression from her video that there was anything wrong with these products, just that they didn't you know, meet her needs. They weren't um, in tune with how she likes to craft. And there are so many products out nowadays that you really can find the exact thing you're looking for. I think in, in stamping anyways, because stamping is still um, still quite popular and there are a lot of companies catering to stampers. So whether you like clean and simple or you like elaborate, you like to have a lot of gadgets or you like to keep it very basic, you will find products to meet your needs. But something I've been noticing lately, um, especially since uh, since the start of the pandemic, is a growing chasm between card makers, crafters, stampers on the internet. And um, and I've, I'm kind of on the fringe. I don't, I'm not really in the thick of it like I used to be. So I think I have a unique perspective on this. I can see the uh, the perspective of a content creator that is using every newest and latest and greatest product and creating beautiful things. I can also see the perspective of somebody who is um, upcycling and using recycled materials, found objects in their art. And I think there is definitely a place for everyone and all styles in between. But what I've been noticing much more lately is a um, a kind of a, a a wave of angst between these two camps of crafting, and it seems rather unnecessary. The first thing I want to talk about today is why is it that we like to click on videos that have some sort of controversy in them, like. Uh, like things I'm no longer buying, especially if there's a thumbnail with like a grumpy face on it. Why does that make us want to click? Why why are we interested in in that sort of um, um, controversy or or even negativity? Those video videos get many more views than like uh, say a video of product recommendations or you know happy sunshine and rainbows. For some reason it makes us click on it, even if maybe even because we think we may disagree with the creator that's made the video. I find that very interesting. I know that when I've done videos that um, may be an unpopular opinion or may from the from the title or thumbnail, you may think there may be some um, some saltiness or some some tea so to speak, those videos do much better. I did a video a few years ago called Things That Irk Me About Card Making and um, it was basically, you know, the fast fashion aspect of the industry. And I'm not saying that any one company is doing anything wrong. I don't necessarily believe that. It's just there's there's so many companies coming out with so much stuff. And a lot of the stuff is very repetitive. If you've been crafting for a long time, you probably have a lot of these same themes and um, products already. Now, somebody that's new, they will really benefit from having that variety. But it can be very, very overwhelming for some of us. And not to say that any company should change what they're doing. It's just, you know, just an idea. A perspective, a different way of thinking, and also a bit of a um, a bit of an out for anyone that feels like they have to have it all. To have somebody with a little bit of a following say, y "You don't, you don't have to have it all. This is one for everybody. Don't feel pressured because if that takes the fun away, there's no, there's no. If 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 trying to go after all those products is actually stifling your creativity. If having all the stuff is stifling your creativity, then then there's no use for it. There's no need of that." Um, I'm about encouraging people to do what's best for them and to enjoy the creative process. So I did a video of things that irked me about card making a few years ago. And um, although the the overall um, sentiment was positive from, from folks in the comments, I did get some, you know, some disgruntled people. 
and uh, apologize for the noise there from my computer. I, I didn't think my computer would make noises if I had a microphone plugged in, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, there was some people that were like, well, you know, don't, don't do it if you don't like it, you know? And it, But it's funny because these would be people that never watched any of my videos before, but they, they click on that one because they think they're going to be offended. So they, they click on it knowing and maybe even wanting to be upset by something. I don't get it. But anyway, uh, negative videos, commentary videos seem to do much better than just your regular craft tutorial. So let's just, let's just put that out there. So yeah, there definitely would be an incentive for somebody who wanted more views on their videos to put out a video that, uh, <clears throat> that had kind of a, um, a little bit of a salacious slant to it. But anyway, I didn't think this video was, uh, was salacious or problematic, but there was one product and actually I know I'd seen this product before. I didn't know who made it. Um, it wasn't something I was interested in. So even though I saw it in some videos, I didn't really, give it another thought because it wasn't something I was looking to purchase. And it was like a, a, uh, I didn't know if it was water plastic, but it was basically something that you could set your ink pad base and cover in. Uh, so it would hold your ink pad still when you were doing ink blending. And, um, and mainly because I rarely have a, a, a square to spare, a square inch to spare on my table when I'm crafting, it just wouldn't work. I wouldn't have any room to put it. But, um, but then as I was seeing her comical like uh, rendition of like an ink pad wobbling around, I thought, you know, somebody that had mobility issues and maybe couldn't reach over and hold the ink pad while they were uh, inking up their ink applicator, that could be really handy for someone with MS or arthritis or other um, disabilities where they couldn't have both of their hands on their table at one time. So I thought, you know, it was me seeing why she didn't like it, why she thought it was completely silly and impractical that made me realize, oh, that, there's a whole market of people that would be interested in that. But it's funny because I never gave it a second thought when I first saw it. So the, I guess, I guess the thing, number one, I don't think there's any such thing as bad publicity, you know, as long as the company's not like actively screwing over their customers, I don't really think there's, um, there's bad publicity. And I mentioned that on the post that I saw on Facebook from a, a stamp company that said that, you know, she threw this company under the bus. It was, or I'm paraphrasing by the way, um, I don't have the post up in front of me, but you know, there were a lot of people that were very upset, especially about that because it was a small company that made these, um, ink stands out of their home. I think the company is called ink stand. Um, but what happened was exactly what I thought would happen. Um, people came out, rallied behind this company, the small company, placed orders. I assume I, people said they placed orders and started showing their ink stands off on social media and how much they enjoyed them. So from that seemingly negative um, mention in a video, it actually generated a lot of positive support. So it actually turned around to be positive for that small business that people were really concerned would be hurt by that video. Um, so I just I thought that was that was interesting. I didn't think she said anything that was that was bad, that was terrible. I saw a lot of people got upset by it. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting. I um, and and I noticed that people give are, are very sensitive these days, especially when it comes to people in the camp of use what you have, make it yourself, make do with what you have, use an older product versus buy the latest and greatest new thing. Now it's a big uh, promotion month on the internet for stamping supplies and things are selling out fast. People are getting very upset when they can't get the products that they want. That's causing a lot of stress for small companies that are trying to guess how much product to release. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Either the company doesn't come out with enough product to satisfy demands or um, they come out with too many releases and too much products and people get upset for pushing product all the time. So what are they supposed to do? You know, obviously they don't want to, they don't want to produce so much that it doesn't get sold, but then if they sell out, they deal with the same sort of um, disgruntled um, complaints that, you know, it's like they can't win. I think it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting time um, in the, paper crafting world in the crafting world in general I think we've got this weird this weird paradigm of fewer stampers I do think there are fewer people enjoying the craft these days to the extent that that we used to if you think of like uh, 10 years ago 15 years ago I, and I know personally because I was scrapbooking my kids were little I was creating you know, dozens of scrapbook pages a year, probably, you know, 100 pages a year. And I was making cards with the scraps and I was um, uh, 
purchasing a lot more than I do now because my kids were younger. I was doing themed parties. I was doing a lot of paper crafting. I was in that season of life. It was also very popular online. There were a lot of magazines available to inspire. Um, I would get my work published in these magazines. So I was very incentivized to create more and submit to magazines. Um, I enjoyed the notoriety, notoriety that came with that. It was, it was an ego boost. It wasn't really a financial boost, but it was an ego boost. And I think that definitely was inspiration and was a motivation for me to do it. I'm not very proud to say that. I mean, I mean, the fact that I needed external validation kind of makes me feel a little um, icky, but uh, but there we are. And as the magazines dried up, companies started to rely on bloggers and YouTubers and um, people and other other influencers on social media to to push their products. And everyone has access to those. You don't have to have a magazine subscription. You don't have to buy a magazine to see these products. You're seeing them everywhere. And I think people are just getting overwhelmed and it's just fueling this, this, um, this debate between the use what you have or minimalist crafting and the buy everything before it sells out because you'll never get it again side. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I don't, I don't think this whole movement is very healthy. Um, it's pitting people against each other. And, um, and I'm never going to tell somebody what they should or shouldn't buy. I think that's an individual choice. I might think, wow, those layered roses look just like the layered roses I have from three years ago. But somebody that absolutely loves layering stamps probably is like, oh, no, they're subtly different. I would use them in this way where I would use those in a completely other way because they use them all the time. So they're justified in, in having all those sets if they want them. Meanwhile, you know, they probably look at my watercolor collection and say, Lindsay, how many tubes of sap green do you need? How many palettes of paint do you need? And I could say, well, you know, there's subtle differences between those those palettes of watercolor, one I would use for landscape, one I would use for botanical, one I would use for layering, one I would use for, because I like the flow and the, you know, <laughs> I would use them for loose florals. So I totally get that. And I also don't think it's a, it's good for any of us to pass judgment to say somebody doesn't need all of this or somebody does need all of that because it's none of our business at the end of the day. Um, I like to see people use their products and buy things that are gonna make them feel good about their craft and not feel ashamed because they have either bought more than they can afford or they've bought more than, than they can manage and keep track of. Because I do think that the, um, the amassing of too many materials is mentally burdensome and I think if you walk into your creative space and you're overwhelmed, you're not going to want to create. You're just going to kind of stand there and look at everything and just be frustrated. And I see this with the up, with the um, cropping up of so many different craft organization groups on Facebook. And I don't even spend that much time on Facebook. And if I'm aware of this stuff, these different uh, conversations going on, and I don't even check into this app every day, it's it's probably even more prominent than I realize. So, uh, so what do you think? I mean, are you, are you more of a use what you have crafter or are you, are you a latest and greatest or are you both? I mean, I definitely go through, go through, um, stages where I'm in an accumulation stage and then I go into a, a stage where I'm a using in a using stage. And then I go into almost like a de-stash or decluttering stage. I noticed that the more I acquire, the more I want to acquire and the only way I've been able to break myself of that is when I find myself in that in that habit is I just do a spending freeze. I do like a uh, I just like, OK, I'm not going to buy any more art supplies for a month for the, the month of this or that. And generally after the first couple of weeks is kind of difficult because I swear to God, everything goes on sale that I want when as soon as I say I'm not going to buy anything. But once I get past those first couple of weeks, I stop looking and I stop noticing and I start looking at what I have. And the more you use what you have, the better you feel about it and the more you create. And then you you don't look for that validation. You don't look to fill that hole of, um, of creativity by buying. You look to fill that hole of creative desire with making. And that's I, I think that's true for most people. Maybe it's not. You can let me know um, what your thoughts on the matter are. But I think that the more we, we create, the more we want to create. The more we buy, the more we want to buy. We get used to a new equilibrium. So if you went from a position in life where maybe you were working full time, you didn't have that much time for creativity. So the only time you would purchase something would be maybe on a monthly retreat. Maybe you went to like a, a crop once a month and you would purchase some paper and some stamps or something while you were there and you would use it. And you know that your amount of time you had to create balanced out with the amount you spent. But then if you were maybe at home and you had more time to create and you found yourself 
on the big craft stores online or the big art suppliers online or Amazon, you found yourself finding little treats every day with free shipping, you get used to that and you get used to that little dopamine hit of ordering it and the little dopamine hit of getting it in the mail. And then maybe it was kind of a drag to put it away or to find a time to use it, but it was easy to buy it. It's easy to buy it and it, and it fills that creative void that we have very similarly. You know, looking around, finding that thing that you've been looking at on sale, it finally goes on sale and it's or it's finally in stock and you and you nab it. That kind of fills that little creative bucket you have. Not as much as if you sat down and you created for a couple hours, but it does meet that need. Just like kind of like organizing your supplies can fill that creative bucket a little bit, even though it's not really creating your organizing, it still fills that um that sense of productivity it's very strange i know when i go to like a stamp show which i haven't been in a couple of years but when i find that really unusual stamp um that fills that that you know that creative bucket a little bit it's like oh i found that thing i've been looking for like something like that i remember i was on the mission to find sushi themed stamps a couple of years ago and i could not find a single one at the stamp show. So I ended up, I, I found them actually on Hallmark scrapbook and I ordered them and I was so happy to find them and I crafted with them and I was so happy to use them. And now they're sitting in a, <laughs> in the, uh, in the food binder, I think uh, with all my other food rubber stamps. But I was just like that, that hunt that filled some sort of, uh, it gave me a, it gave me a rush to find them. It filled that bit of creativity that, um, that could have been filled by me just using what I have. It could have been filled with me drawing a picture of some sushi and watercoloring it in my sketchbook. Um, those, all those things would fill that same bucket. Um, some would fill them for a longer time and cost less like using what I already have to create that. But, you know, I got a kick out of finding the stamps. I get a kick out of using the stamps. So I'm not unhappy about that. I made quite a few little cards with them and they're cute and I would use them again. But um, I think it's interesting how these different, these different, uh, what do I want to call it? These different activities can kind of fill that same yearning that we have to be creative and productive. What do you think? Do you have that same, that same experience I, a couple like three or four years ago I went to the stamp show I think it was probably three years ago I think it was the year before the sushi I was looking for these layered macaroon stamps and actually I thought I found them on Amazon and I ordered them but I just got one sentiment it was the the photos didn't match the listing so anyway um I'm like well that's all right I'm gonna find them at the stamp show because I know the company that makes them the impression obsession was gonna help would, would be there and I could probably find them and they also had some other layered stamps that I thought were really cute because they were all like desserts there was um, there was macarons, there was like an ice cream sundae, and I think like an ice cream cone. And they were the cutest things. They looked like photographs when you had them all stamped, but like really kind of like almost like silk screen photograph type uh, images. I thought they were adorable. I'd never seen anything like them. And I was on a mission to find them. And I w went to the stamp show and they did not have them. And um, so I was really bummed out because I really just wanted to see them and touch them and buy them and bring them home. And, you know, I, you know, I have to drive five hours to a stamp show to begin with. So it's not like a small feat. So it does feel like, you know, it's like you've, you've, you've gone through this journey when you go, when you go to a stamp show to find these, these, you know, unusual cool things. I do anyway. Um, I, I guess a lot of, uh, a lot of the stampers, I think, that are really popular right now are purchasing the latest and greatest online or they're getting the latest and greatest from design teams or from PR from companies and then showing them and uh, making their living from affiliate sales. That's probably how most of the big um, stampers on YouTube are making their living. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I personally like to find those unusual weird gems, those weirdo things that probably no one else can even find again. Um, that's what I like. So I'm not going to be somebody who makes their living off affiliate links just because most of these stores don't have affiliate programs or if I, you know, if you can even find them again, it's going to be few and far between. That's, that's kind of what I get a kick out of. That's what I like. Um, so, you know, to, to, to each their own. That's what makes me excited about stamping is just finding the weird stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I ended up um, looking on their website and actually they had a sale and I was able to buy them all for cheaper than I would have at the stamp show anyway. And I got them and then I got them home and I stamped with them and I was so excited to stamp with them. They were the most difficult st uh, la layering stamps in general I find to be so difficult. I love the way they look, but man, oh man, they always take so much time. And I'm like, why didn't I just paint a picture? I could have painted this in like a fraction of the time of like picking out the inks and lining them all up. And so I try to make a bunch when I'm doing it and I get so frustrated and why did I buy these <laughs> by the time I'm done with it? But um, 
And that would maybe if I did other things I would not buy again, I would totally buy the macaron stamps again. They're pretty, they're just so cute. They're totally worth the effort. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stamps like that where it's like, oh, a doily die. There was this really intricate doily die. And I thought about it and I looked at all the doily dies available and I, I settled down on this one by Cherry Lynn. I knew they were going to be at the stamp show. And this was probably like, I don't know, this might have been my first or second stamp show ever. <laughs> a long time ago. And um, and I bought it. And I have a very old Big Shot. My Big Shot's like 15 years old. That's a die cutter I have. And it was released before those really thin dies came out. So um, so it, they weren't really designed for those really intricate dies. I had such a hard time cutting that thing out. I had to cut it so many times, put it back through, shim it, just to get a perfect doily. And it was so frustrating. And I did keep it because it's so pretty. And sometimes I will put the effort in on that die, but I'm like, I'm never buying another doily die again because it was so frustrating to use. I, I still like the product. I think it's beautiful. It's just not for me. I wouldn't tell anybody else not to buy it, but that's just my opinion. Um, and actually I did a video on how I figured out how to cut it. And I, um, I did receive some flack saying that, you know, uh, you're being too harsh on that die. And, but I also got an email from the owner, the maker of the die who um, sent me a new platform because my platform was old and that's why it wasn't cutting properly. So they, he didn't get any negative publicity from that. If anything, he, I did actually did a re video. I, I redid the video. I did another video an update saying I had the wrong things. This is going to make it cut so much easier in my work for you. And it ended up being a win-win and that's happened many times. And I think, I really don't think there's, if anybody has good intentions and a company is good, that's putting out these process, these products, I don't think there's such a thing as bad publicity. If somebody is a good company and they've treated people right, even if somebody says something bad about them, their fans will come and rally to their support and it will only become good publicity. It'll introduce more people that had never heard of them, that company before. I never heard about the ink stand company. And um, I probably personally won't purchase that product, but I would recommend it to somebody who has mobility issues because I think it would be a huge help. It would be something that would make the difference between being able to do these techniques in an efficient manner or throwing your ink pads out the window because you're so frustrated with them. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, I think that the internet loves drama and I don't think there's really going to be negative effects from from that. I just thought it was interesting how how many people got really upset over that video, which I didn't think was really being mean. And people were accusing this creator of being mean. And, uh, and I just didn't see it. But anyway, uh, it's dangerous to speak your mind online. I definitely feel more comfortable doing it in a podcast form because you know, it's a much smaller audience. But um, but anyway, I'd be interested to know what you think. I don't know how comments work on podcasts. I'm still so new at this. But it's fun to have a place where we can uh, go a little deeper into the more nuanced topics. I always say what's on my mind in my videos. And I try to be as kind as possible. If I think something is a dangerous product or I think something is... Um, really overpriced or really uh, wasteful or problematic, I, I would mention it, you know, I but I probably wouldn't buy it to begin with, though. That's a thing. And I really don't give my opinions on things that I don't personally own because, um, or if I don't own it, I'll explain why I don't own it, but I won't tell anybody else not to own it unless I think like maybe the company's done something unethical or, or bad. Um, but in that case, I just try not to give them any publicity because like I just mentioned, there's really no such thing as bad publicity. Publicity. If I go on my soapbox and I complain about some company that I don't like because I think they're unethical, what I'm going to end up doing is giving this company a ton of free publicity, which is probably going to end up with more sales for them. And if that's a company I don't like, I don't think is ethical, then um, then I don't do it. There's a, there's a handful of companies that I really try my best to avoid talking about because I think they're unethical and I think that they have um, um, they've screwed over customers and I really just don't want to give them any attention because I know that by getting into it, it's going to make people curious and people will start, I don't want to see my audience hurt or, you know, give any attention to people that I don't think are, are doing good for the community. I, people that I think are like environmentally wasteful or um, pushing people down a bad path or taking advantage of people. I see, I do see, I do see some influencers taking advantage of their audience and getting them to buy things that A, they can't afford, B, they can't possibly use up in their lifetime and, uh, and C, just spending more than they need to, or feeling like they have to spend in order to be part of the crowd. I see that 
not too often, but sometimes. And, um, and I know a lot of these people buy because they want that friendship of the influencer and they want to be thought of as, you know, as a supporter. And, um, and some of these influencers are laughing all the way to the bank. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right to, to use your audience like that. Um, because they do think of you as a friend and would you tell your best friend to buy this thing? And that's what I think before I recommend something, would I tell my best friend to buy this thing or would I tell my best friend, Hey, uh, I think I would hold off on that one and get this one instead. So that's how I try to act. And I'm sure that I've missed out on, you know, probably thousands of dollars of affiliate sales, but it's not worth it. It's not worth it to, you know, I don't want to have dirty money, I guess. I don't know. I think there's a pot for every lid. I think that most of the products out there in the crafting industry are going to be good for somebody, but nobody needs them all. And I think that's what this, this uh, YouTuber was saying, you know, it wasn't right for her. It doesn't mean it's not right for you. And there certainly was a lot of backlash for it, which I think is unwarranted. Um, but anyway, I also don't think there's any, that, that it's going to backfire on that creator either. She's going to have a lot more views on that and, and probably a lot more interest in other videos. And I think that's a, ultimately a good thing as well, because I don't think she meant any harm by, uh, by what she posted. Um, I'm very, I, I tend not to, um, not to drop names just because I, I don't know what they would, if they would want me to or not. So that might be completely frustrating, but I'm sure, I'm sure probably anybody watching this podcast has been recommended this video that I'm talking about and you know who, who I'm talking about. And, uh, yeah, I don't, and, and you probably know the person that, that, uh, posted it on their Facebook page. I, I think they're both lovely people. Um, and I don't think anybody meant any harm overall, but man, you, you start throwing something out there on the internet, it's going to get all fired up. And I just thought it would be interesting to just kind of, um, kind of look at it from a kind of outside perspective, I guess. Anyway, that's all I have to say on that topic. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye.